Hello and welcome. All right, hopefully that was a seamless transition. Uh, I was just hanging out in the Discord with some folks, so uh, nice to meet you, Mario. Nice to see you again, Triton. And uh, let me see if we can get rolling here. So, hey, look at that. Okay, my wife and I changed up our signals, so she's using a laser pointer and now pointing at signs on the wall that tell me if things are broken. It's probably a better system, to be honest, but a little, uh, little new. All right, so as I've done the last couple of weeks, I'll start off the stream just sort of floating head in the sky. A little bit of overview on the uh, stream itself. So uh, for anyone new to the stream, each week we pick a new national park to explore together. This week we're exploring Olympic National Park, as you can see down here. <laughs> we also vote near the end on the next national park we'd like to explore together. So look out for that and other posts coming in the chat. Also feel free to post thoughts, questions. Uh, or anything else as we fly. I know some of you are in VR, so if that's the case, there's a Discord voice channel now that you can go and hang out in, uh, a little more social. Feel free to mute me if you want. You can watch if you want. I don't, doesn't matter. Just a good place to hang out and explore new areas. Little disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, but we'll be taking full advantage of the simulator. So please don't try this in real life. I've also researched the park in preparation and uh, also researched a couple of related topics. And then I go and help improve their Wikipedia pages. So using Wikipedia, make sure the facts here are cited and checked by others, and gives back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour together. To that end, if you notice anything that's incomplete or could be better clarified, please go up, update the wiki pages. As the wiki community, as the wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. So without further ado, I'm Jules Altus, and I'll be your pilot this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore Olympic National Park. I'm seeing a couple of chat messages. I'll try and catch up on those ones. Hey, thank you, Fractals. Let me spin around here. I forgot to do this last time, so I see a bunch of people line up in a way. Hello, everyone. Okay, so I'm going to pop in. We'll get a takeoff while going here. I picked this runway and this particular airport because I really liked the departure from one way 8. Uh, so hopefully you'll enjoy it as well if you haven't already, uh, already seen it. Yep, I'm going to fly right through Flying Singer. Hello there. Okay, should I get up enough speed here? All right, I'll pop out of the plane so you can see. Nice little bay to take off from. Actually, the airport at the end of the stream is also very fun, uh, so you can look forward to that when we get a little bit further along. So Fractal's posted up uh, a poll here. If you uh, Have you ever been to the National Park before? So yes, in the last 10 years. Yes, once upon a time, or not yet. Okay. Fractals. Uh, Chance Bro, so I'm using a what's called a DA62, so it's a, a twin engine plane. A nice little plane, actually. It was one of my favorites. Uh, low wing sort of thing. Uh, also, quick time sync for everyone else who's flying along, if you do want to be at the same time. So it's about, four, oops, I'm going to make this 405 here. And then also uh, overcast weather is what I'm using. It is very pretty in blue skies. It doesn't feel very realistic for those of you who have spent much time in Washington. That's why I went for the overcast look, but uh, but that's another option if you'd like. Uh, Chance Bro, I know you're another VR flyer. If you want to hang out, we're in the Discord too. So there's a uh, conversations going on there. A couple administrative updates today. So this is the first time I mentioned before we're using a voice channel in Discord. So shout out to everyone flying along and chatting in there. Uh, I'll come and hang out after the stream for a couple minutes. I was hanging out in before the stream for a couple minutes as well. Uh, nice to meet all of you who I already got to meet. It also means that we're putting Fractals to work right after his vacation. So thanks, Fractals. Uh, he'll be sharing the stream to the Discord as well. So if you just want to watch the stream as sort of a, a share in Discord, that works great there. I also had a suggestion come in last week for more airport stops along the route. So if you're someone who likes that sort of um, sort of thing, I know when I've done fly-ins in the past, I've really enjoyed stopping at various airports along the way. Uh, so I'll think about ways that we might be able to, might be able to do that for future parks. Uh, not for this week, but, um, but it's a good one. I'll, I'll keep that in mind. If you like that idea or if you have other ideas, uh, feel free to send input in Discord or else you can post it in the... Uh, uh, in the survey that Fractals will send out at the end. So there's a couple of different ways. I'm always open to new ideas for the stream, so, so keep them coming. All right. 
that I think covers all of our background information. So it looks like we have uh, a couple of people who have been here once upon a time, one person who's been there the last 10 years, and then we have quite a few not yet, uh, which is always exciting to go explore a new place. So I'm in that not yet category. I've never been to Olympic National Park, although I definitely need to get out there. Um, it's a, a beautiful state to go visit and a lot of cool parks in the area. For those of you who are here from Mount Rainier, you'll remember. Thanks, Fractals. Or uh, Flying Singer, I'm saying, okay. Um, all right, so let's talk about Olympic National Park. Before I do that, though, I'm going to actually set up my autopilot so I can free up cognitive load. Make sure I don't get behind this airplane. So I typically show how I set up autopilot for those where it may be helpful. Uh, so what I'll do here is I'll actually, I'm at about 2,100, 2,000 works just fine. So I'm going to turn on uh, nav mode. And then I'll turn on a hold altitude mode. So I'll be at 2,100. Uh, I, in the flight plan, I have 2,000, both work. And then enable autopilot. And that should get me right back on track. Also pop out the plane a little bit here so folks can see uh, the rest of the group. And then also the landscape itself is really pretty. Unfortunately, the plane is, the windows are a little bit clunky in the plane. So. Let's see, flying with my <laughs> gear, gear down, my flaps down. Rough start, that's okay. I'm Rosno, okay, cool. Been there as well. So, the purpose of Olympic National Park is to preserve for the benefit, use, and enjoyment of the people a large wilderness park containing the finest examples of uh, prim primeval forest of uh, Sitka spruce, western hemlock, Douglas fir, and western red cedar in the entire United States. It's one clause. To provide suitable winter range and permanent protection for the herds of native Roosevelt elk and other wildlife indigenous to the area. To conserve and render available to the people for recreational use this outstanding mountainous country. With this outstanding mountainous country containing numerous glaciers and perpetual snow fields and a portion of the surrounding verdant forest together with a narrow strip along the beautiful western coast. It's kind of a, a long park purpose, but for those of you who haven't heard uh, in, in past streams, I'll typically do uh, include the park purpose statement because I think that's the best summary of a park. If I were to go visit a new park, that would be something I'd look up right away. What are the key things that the park exists to, to help protect and why, why it's an important place? Now, there is a little bit of a background park video. This week it's a bit more kind of here are the fun things to do in the park, less about the park, more about kind of visiting the park, um, but it's still a really good overview and it's a fun, a fun ranger we get to meet. So why don't I pull that up real quick? The question we hear most often from visitors is, what is there to see and do here? And the short answer is so much. It's a really good question, actually. This park is huge and really diverse, so you have a lot of choices to make when you get here, but you can handle it. And we're going to break it down a little bit to get you started. There are three major ecosystems in Olympic, and you could see all three in one day or spend a lifetime exploring and still not cover everything. There's the Pacific Coast with its beaches, sea stacks, sunsets, tide pools, and giant drift logs. There are the Olympic mountains crowned with glaciers and wreathed in clouds with wildflowers, animals, and views all the way to Canada on clear days. There are temperate rainforests with ancient moss-covered trees, steaming ferns, sweet clean air, and peaceful quiet broken in fall by the bugling of elk. As if that wasn't already a lot, besides those three major ecosystems, there are also lakes, river valleys, hot springs, waterfalls, and old growth forests. So what can you do with all that? You can bird watch, stargaze, climb a mountain, soak in a hot spring, paddle a boat or a board, pick berries, cook dinner on a campfire, or eat in a restaurant, fish, ski, swim, tide pool, take a short hike, or a long hike, or a day hike, or a week-long backpacking trip, camp in a campground, stay in a cabin or hotel, see wildlife, go to a ranger program. You have options, lots of them. And as you get ready, there are going to be some questions only you can answer, 
like, how much time do I want to spend driving versus actually being at a place? Do I want to see the big hits and crowd pleasers or get off the beaten path to find hidden gems? Do I want to stay close to civilization or get out into the wilderness? Do I want to sleep in the backcountry, a campground, a cabin, a room in a town? How much am I willing and able to hike? Wait, do I even like hiking? Olympic is a big, complex, and beautiful park. So think about what you like and what you want. Start there and then let us help you have your best experience here. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. Thanks, Ranger Crystal. Kind of a fun little little overview of the park. Uh, and I liked, one of the questions at the end struck me as interesting, which is, you know, you go to visit a national park and you think, oh, I should be out in nature, I should be hiking and climbing and all that kind of stuff. And if that's not what you want to do in the national park, then don't. You know, like a lot of these parks, Olympic being a good example, have great ways to drive up and see all the beautiful sights, uh, and that's totally fine. All right, so just off to our, our right wing here, this is called Point of the Arches. I'll pull up a picture of this so you can see it. The game kind of captures it up close, a little clunky, uh, but the it's actually closer to what it looks like in real life than, than I expected, so I'll, I'll show you real quick. Oops. So this is what Point of the Ar Points of the Arches, excuse, Point of the Arches looks like. And you can see sort of the those rocks that you saw off in the distance out here. So that's kind of a famous shot that you might go and see. It's at the northern edge of the coastal part of the park. So we're going to fly along uh, quite a few different aspect or different places in the park. Let me flip back to this, and I want to show the path we're going to be taking because it helps to get a little bit of context of where how this park all kind of fits together. So let me flip over to this big iPad view. So uh, Olympic National Park has a strip over on the west coast here that we're flying along now. And then it kind of, it's detached from the rest of the park. And then the majority of the park is over inland uh, around Mount Olympus. And so we're actually going to fly along the coast first. And then we'll cut over, we'll fly up the whole river. And then uh, we'll cut up to the glaciers, cross Mount Olympus, and then head back out the park. Should be a beautiful flight. So that covers kind of the purpose of Olympic National Park. A uh, little bit of background on things you can do. A nice little blooper reel, uh, which is what I sound like when I warm up, by the way, before the stream. I'm like sitting up here going, you know, hello and welcome. Hello and welcome. And just trying out, you know, get your voices right, right? Let me pull up for our person of the week. We're going to talk about President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, AKA FDR. So you're probably familiar with this person, but if not, here's a picture. Now, a natural choice for this park would have been Teddy Roosevelt, actually, because the park is made to protect the Roosevelt elk. And so uh, we have done Teddy Roosevelt in past parks, so I didn't want to repeat a, a personal week. Uh, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually had a pretty big impact as well. So while Theodore Roosevelt originally designated the park as Mount Olympus National Monument in 1909, uh, FDR designated it a national park, well, along with Congress, in 1938. So that's why he's sort of an important figure for the park. FDR was, so a little bit of background, FDR was an American politician who served as the 32nd president of the United States from 1933 until his death in 1945. It's 12 years, notice. A member of the Democratic Party, he won a record four presidential elections and became a central figure in world events during the first half of the 20th century. Roosevelt directed the federal government during most of the Great Depression, implementing his New Deal domestic agenda in response to the worst economic crisis in U.S. history. As a dominant leader of his party, he built the New Deal Coalition, which defined moderate liberalism in the, modern liberalism in the United States throughout the middle third of the 20th century. His third and fourth terms were dominated by World War II, which ended shortly after he died in office. In the 1932 presidential election, Roosevelt defeated Republican incumbent Hubert, Herbert Hugh Hoover, in a landslide, who you may remember when we visited uh, Kenai Fjords National Park because there's a uh, ice field up there named after Hubert Hoover. 
So he took over after that, and he took office in the midst of the Great Depression, which again was the worst economic crisis we'd seen. During his first 100 days, Roosevelt spearheaded unprecedented federal legislation and issued a profusion of executive orders that instituted the New Deal, a variety of programs designed to produce relief, recovery, and reform. Roosevelt is usually rated by scholars among the nation's greatest presidents, with George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, but he has also been a subject to substantial criticism. If you're curious to learn more about that criticism, it is an interesting rabbit hole, uh, but I'll leave that to you and Wikipedia to go check out. One of the criticisms and it kind of a top line one is he was president for four terms, which is nowadays sort of an odd thought, but, but that was how he did it. So that's a little bit about uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Fractals. I know you're juggling a bunch of balls here. Were you able to get the poll up for, for our first topic here? And Fractals and I were talking a little bit. It may be possible that people in Discord could also vote on the polls in the same way that people watching and using the Twitch chat can vote. Uh, if that's something of interest, let me and Fractals know. But right now what we're doing is just uh, vote, in, vote in Twitch. So our first topic for today is elk. You remember in the Park Purpose and also with FDR, we talked about Roosevelt elk, which is a type of elk. So what causes antlers to grow? Is it got to be testosterone, right? Or the great equalizing force, constipation. Or excess food gets turned into antlers. Give people a second to vote here. Hey there, odd reasoning. I still call you wafer girl in my head, which I think is funny. Um, I don't know when that'll go away, if ever, but it's, it's pretty amusing. We used Oreos for one of the past live streams, for those of you who weren't there. So. Uh, okay, connection to the park. So we're talking about elk here because President Theodore Roosevelt, when he originally created Mount Olympus National Monument, primarily created it to protect the subalpine calving grounds and summer range of the Roosevelt elk herds native to the Olympics. So those Roosevelt elk herds that live around here is kind of the, the key reason that he wanted to make sure it was protected. <laughs> yep. Sorry, odd reasoning. You can try, but... All right, we got about six votes. We'll give folks just a second here. It looks like we're kind of kind of leaning around uh, the top one. Got to be testosterone, right? Of course, maybe constipation, you know. Could be, could be a lot of things. So we'll talk a little bit more about antlers uh, later on, but at least for this poll, the correct answer here was testosterone. That's also why they lose their antlers uh, towards the end of the year. That's because the testosterone levels start to drop again. So testosterone to grow the antlers, testosterone then dropping loses the antlers. There you go. So what are elk? We'll start with Roosevelt elk. Uh, Roosevelt, and then most of the topic's gonna be about elk in general, but just to, to tie it back to the park. Roosevelt elk grow to around 6 to 10 feet in length and stand 2.5 to 5.6 feet tall up to their shoulder blades. Roosevelt elk bulls, let me pull up a picture of that, generally weigh between 700 and 1,100 pounds, while cows, females, weigh about 600 pounds. It's the largest of four surviving subspecies of elk in North America by body mass and in the wild uh, Roosevelt elk rarely live beyond 12 to 15 years, but in captivity, they've been known to live up to 25 years. Elk in general, then, I'll pull up another picture. It looks pretty similar, but just to give a little bit of, of compare and contrast. So here's another bull picture. This is a, just an, an elk. And then a picture of a cow. Now you notice on the tail of the, the cow here and on all the, the hind quarters of, of elk, there's that little patch of kind of... Uh, rump hair it, like in this picture it's the white rump so you may hear elk called wap, uh, wapiti uh, especially in europe that's the name you might hear but uh, people also say it here it originates from that name originates from the shawnee and cree word uh wapiti which means white rump so that's the actual name that that was used by uh shawnee and cree as a quick aside and i know some folks have mentioned in the past that they I uh, do like the kind of etymology of some of these words. Uh, if you are interested in more etymology of, of elk, I would highly recommend checking it out. It's one of the most complicated name transitions between different cultures and sort of back and forth uh, across continents that I've seen in, in probably any wiki page ever. 
Uh, it's too complicated to get too complicated to get into here, but if you're curious, uh, elk turns out to be a very complex one. So what do elk look like? We pulled up a couple of pictures, but they have thick bodies with slender legs and short tails. They also have a clearly defined rump patch, I showed you that picture a moment ago, uh, with short tails. They have different coloration based on the seasons and the type of habitats, uh, with gray or lighter coloration prevalent in the winter and more reddish dark coat in the summer. As to their antlers, I'll pull up another picture here, another version of a, an elk you can see. Uh, when we went to Gates of the Arctic National Park, we learned about caribou, and we talked a lot about how antlers grow and shed, and so I won't go into much more detail here. If you're curious to learn about that, uh, check out the Gates of the Arctic stream. But in short, antlers are made of bone, which grow at a rate of about, uh, which their antlers grow at a rate of about one inch per day. While actively growing, a soft layer of highly vas uh, vascular skin known as this velvet covers and protects them. This is then shed in the summer when the antlers have fully developed. So they grow underneath this velvet. Once they finish growing, the velvet comes off. Bull elk typically have around six tines on each antler. The Siberian and North American elk carry the largest antlers, uh, while there's other elk, well, the, the largest antlers. The antlers on a Roosevelt bull can weigh up to 40 pounds. Formation retention of antlers, like we talked about in the poll, is testosterone driven. So in late winter and early spring, the testosterone level, levels drop, and that causes the antlers to shed. They are like most deer in that only the males grow horns, not the females. That was different than caribou, uh, where both the males and females can grow horns. So, or antlers, excuse me, antlers. Uh, so something, something to keep in mind for differences from the last one we looked at. Let me catch up on the chat here. <laughs> yeah, fractals, right? Okay, so where do they live? Uh, they live in parts of North America and parts of Asia. I'll pull up their range map here because it's easier just to glance at. And you'll see the uh, reconstructed versus recent ranges of elk. Kind of gets right up into Washington. Elk and red deer were introduced. The, another kind of interesting thing about where they live. So elk and red deer were introduced to Argentina in the 20th century. In Argentina, right? So that was not on that range map we just looked at. There, they are now considered an invasive species, encroaching on Argentinian ecosystems where they compete for food with the indigenous herbivores. This negative impact on native animal species has led the identification of elk as one of the worst, world's worst, I'm sorry, has led to the identification of elk as one of the world's 100 worst invaders. They're, they're actually a very big problem down in Argentina. They introduced them in a couple other places too, and they've been problems everywhere. Um, typically, I think invasive species, I think kind of small and invasive, but in this case, it's just a full-grown elk that shouldn't be in Argentina. Uh, one thing that came up a lot while I was researching is sort of hunting these different animals, like going elk hunting or deer hunting. Uh, has anyone ever been elk hunting before? And did you have any luck? I would love to hear if it was, was a cool experience or kind of what that was like. Um, I'm not a big hunter myself. I, uh, I was an okay shot back in the Boy Scouts. You know, uh, I don't know how I do in an actual hunting situation, but... Let me pull up quick. So we're coming up on this waypoint called Ruby Beach. So let me show that. Okay, so that's a picture of Ruby Beach. Again, we have those uh, sea stacks off in the distance and you see a lot of driftwood up on the shore. For those of you flying around the game, if you did want to get really low along the shoreline, you can actually see the logs. They're, they're really big, um, but you can see them just kind of recreated in the game. Not three-dimensional, but they're in the texture. The other piece, we're going to be turning here in just a second on the Ho River. And this is sort of what this looks like uh, out of the mountainous region. So just to give you a sense of, of what we're going to be seeing here. And that's just off to our right here. So we'll be following that river for the next uh, chunk of distance. Yeah, I'll catch up on the chat. <laughs> a two-week hunting trip, and he caught one the first day. Wow, there you go. That's some some good luck. Oh, I see. <laughs> I see. Uh, I think I'm the straggler here. That's right. That's what I get for having my landing gear down when I was when I was taking off. Rackles, that's pretty funny. 
It's a good, uh... You never know what's gonna happen, I guess, when you go out. A little bit of information on migration of elk. So, as is true for many species of deer, especially those in mountainous regions, elk migrate into areas of higher altitude in the spring, following the retreating snows, and the opposite direction in the fall. So as the snow melts, then they go higher and come back down in the summer. Their main predators are wolves, coyotes, black, brown and black bears, cougars, and Siberian tigers. Bulls are more vulnerable to predation by wolves in late winter, after they have been weakened by months of chasing females and fighting. So we'll talk about their uh, social life and kind of mating habits, but they spend all, all summer into, into the you know, summer and fall uh, chasing females, literally chasing females, and fighting. Um, and so I thought it was interesting that th right after that, then they're most, most likely to get attacked by a wolf. Sort of makes sense. A little bit about how they adapt to their environment. So again, when we talked about caribou, we talked about tons of different ways that they have survival mechanisms. So I'll just do a quick touch on them here. During the fall, elk grow a thicker coat of fur, which helps to insulate them during the winter. Both male and female North American elk grow thick neck manes, and females of other, where, where other females, uh, species of, I'm sorry, where females of other species typically don't grow a kind of thick neck mane. So that's one way that they keep warm. Then by early summer, the heavy winter coat has, coat has been shed. Pull up a picture of that real quick. I also flipped this in cockpit view because it's kind of a fun, fun part of the flight for that. And here's that, there's that, uh, that coat coming off. So there's the winter coat being shed. They'll often rub themselves against trees or other objects to help remove the uh, hair from their bodies. So if they're kind of scratching up against something, that might be why. Another interesting thing about elk, they're a very gregarious deer species, which a uh, very, very social species in general. More uh, during the summer, the group size can reach up to 400 individuals, so very large groups. For most of the year, adult males and females are segregated into different herds. The female herds are larger, while bulls form small groups and may even travel alone. Male and female herds come together during the mating season, of course, which may begin in late August, more or less. Looks like Lady Gaga. <laughs> Fractals, that's funny. That's probably what she, uh, inspiration drawn from nature sort of situation. That's good. So, so I mentioned mating seasons in late August. What does that look like? During this time, bulls enter. Uh, bulls compete for females to include in their harems. A bull will also defend his harem of twenty cows or more from competing bulls and predators. So, to get another cow in the harem, uh, the bull will actually run and literally chase them back. And if they try to leave, they go and chase them out. So, when I said they're chasing females all mating season, it's it's quite literal. Males try to intimidate rival males by vocalizing and displaying their antlers. If neither bull backs down, they engage in antler wrestling, something that can sustain serious injuries. This is something that can really damage another elk. Something like this. Bulls also dig holes in the ground, which they then urinate in and roll their bodies around. That urine soaks into their hair and gives them a distinct smell, which attracts cows. I would have assumed to keep off the males, but it's actually a, an attraction mechanism. There you go. The other thing they mentioned vocalization, and in the intro video too, they mentioned bugling of the, the bulls. So bulls have this loud, high-pitched, whistle-like vocalization called bugling. And when they're doing it, it looks like this. When, and this bugling advertises the male's fitness over great distances. Uh, the vocalization is also used to establish dominance over other bulls. Kind of, we talked about that a moment ago. I'm going to play the sound of the vocalization because you'll hear why they call it bugling. Uh, it shouldn't be too loud, but let me put it on. That is something you may hear when you go visit Olympic National Park. All the different uh, bulls vocalizing. Oh. Okay. This is that part of the river I showed a picture of earlier. It's kind of right around here. Last bit of information on elk. So younger, less dominant bulls, which are also known as spike bulls, uh, because their antlers haven't yet forked, so it's just a single kind of spiked antler. 
will harass unguarded cows during mating season. These bulls are impatient and will not perform any courtship rituals and will continue to pursue a female even after she signals him to stop. As such, they are less reproductively successful and a cow may, a cow may stay close behind a bigger bull to avoid harassment. Dominant bulls are intolerant of spike bulls and will chase them away from their harems. This is the uh, a phenomenon. I wanted to find a picture of a spike bull. I tried to find something that would, would kind of show this in action. Um, it's kind of interesting, this idea. Little, little spike bulls going around and not following the rules. So that's a little bit about elk. Uh, in summary, elk are a key reason why Olympic National Park was created, although uh, you may also hear elk called uh, wapiti, especially in Europe. They're one of the largest species within the deer family and have a clearly defined rump patch with short tails. They're very social animals, and during mating season you may see them wrestling with antlers. Males will also bugle uh, at that time to show their fitness. Of course, we'll close out with a little joke here. I try to end each section with sort of a, a wrap-up joke of varying success, I would say. A fractal sometimes has to bail me out, but that's okay. So this is a hunting-related one. Three guys went on a hunting trip. The first guy went out hunting and came back with a deer. How did you get that? The other two asked. I followed the tracks, he said. I followed the tracks. I followed the tracks. And boom, I got a deer. So the second guy went out hunting and came back later with an elk. How did you get that? The other two asked. The second guy answers, I followed the tracks, followed the tracks, followed the tracks. Boom, I got an elk. So the third guy went out hunting and came back with his clothes torn to shreds, his gun smashed, his boot missing, all around just a mess. What happened to you? The other two asked. The third guy answers, well, I found the tracks, I followed the tracks, I followed the tracks, followed the tracks, and boom, I got hit by a train. Sort of a, an elk-affiliated joke, we'll say. All right, let me jump in here. Oh, <laughs> except reasoning. So I'm going to jump in here, and I'm actually going to climb up quite a bit here because we need to be at about 7,000 feet. So for those of you flying along uh, a little bit, uh, we may need to circle, actually, to climb. We'll see how this goes. I should have started climbing a couple minutes back. Okay, so what I'm going to do here, I already have nav mode on, so I'm going to turn on uh, vertical speed mode and set my desired altitude to 7,000. And then I'm going to start myself climbing here. And I'm going to climb at 1,000 feet per minute. Uh, actually, I'm going to go 1,200. And then bring in full power. And that should hopefully get me set up for success here. Another thing you can play with, for those of you who are in the sim, if you are so inclined, uh, adding a little bit of snow is kind of uh, nice for this particular park. Nice aesthetic to it. Oops, I have my thing covering it, so I'll leave that up for just a little bit here while we climb. Well, thank you, Fractals. I already got the pull up. I've got five votes all on nitrogen. Nice, okay. Uh, so our second topic today, then, is ecosystems. And talk about ecosystems... Uh, oh, let me pull up real quick, actually. So this part of the park that we're in... And M. Rosna, when you went, I'd be curious if you went to visit the rainforest here. But this part of the park is particularly well-known as a great place to go hiking. This uh, Ho River Valley... Uh, sorry, uh, Ho Rainforest Trail. And I worry that I may be mispronouncing that. It's H-O-H. -H, uh, so if someone knows better the pronunciation. Um, the rainforest trail itself, though, looks like this, which is why it's so uh, famous. It's just a gorgeous place to go and walk around. And it's a temperate rainforest in the U.S., which is not a very common thing. There's only a couple of them that are around. It's a fun place to go visit. Highly recommended. FSFS streamer. I've done that. Nice. Okay. Yeah, it is pretty. What did you think, uh, FSFS streamer? Uh, okay, so... And we did, it's very easy to find. Cool. I'm Rosna, also recommend it. Yeah, it was interesting flight planning this because this valley actually stays at about the same elevation almost the entire way. I got someone doing a spiral dive. Nice, Mario. 
uh, it stays about the same elevation almost the entire way, uh, right up until you get to the glacier. Uh, did, uh, FSFS streamer and Emrazen, did you hike to the glacier itself or, or just the, the first part of it? I can show it kind of on here, actually. So we're flying along, and there's the dotted path. Is That's the trail. So we're actually flying the trail you would hike. Right up to Elk Lake. Oh, what a coincidence. Okay. So Fractal's posted it up, and it looks like you all uh, nailed it. So it's 100% on the correct answer, which is nitrogen. So the poll was, what nutrient typically is a limiter on ecosystem production? And as everyone got, it was nitrogen. Gave up about halfway. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, just first part. Tickles on for a long ways. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was noting, too. It's a, it's a long but pretty one. All right, I'm watching my altitude here. I want to make sure that we're not going to be in trouble as we get up closer. So like I said, our first or our second topic today, excuse me, is ecosystems. And the reason for that is within Olympic National Park, there are three distinct ecosystems, including a subalpine forest, a, f a wildflower meadow, temperate rainforest. I'm sorry, including subalpine forest and wildflower meadow, one ecosystem, temperate rainforest, and rugged Pacific coast. So we just flew over the rugged Pacific coast. We are just passing over this temperate rainforest is back where we just were. And I'm going to actually turn off snow so you can see what it looks like in the summer here. I'm also going to change, I have it as overcast right now, which is uh, pretty and maybe more realistic, but I'm going to actually bring it to high level clouds just to give it that bit more sunlight as we finish out the park here. Uh, it's up to everyone here if you would like to also switch to high level clouds or whatever you prefer. Uh, the reason for that is as we get to this uh, lake towards the end of the flight, it'll be a good one for uh, a summer view. It's more of a summer lake. You'll see. All right. This is the Blue Glacier. So this is the one that I mentioned um, at the end of that trail. If you come up to see, you'll see Blue Glacier. I'll pull up and there's another glacier here that we're just going to fly over just in a moment here. Oops. Let me pull up a picture of Blue Glacier so you can see it. That's Blue Glacier. Hey there, Mario. Yeah, auto racing still tons of snow. Yeah, yeah, there is. It's like that. That was actually why I turned it off because it's, it's kind of nice to see how much of this is is glacial covering. That uh, gives a lot of perspective, I think, for the park. All right, I'm gonna stay at seven thousand here until we get to the next waypoint, and I'm sorry, until I get to Hurricane Ridge, and then after Hurricane Ridge, I'll start descending down to uh, three thousand feet. So we'll stay. We'll stay up here for a little while. Thank you very much. My wife was telling me I still have my picture up. Thank you. <laughs> nice crazy take out. Yeah. Yeah, those uh, upper Midwest winters can be pretty weird. Hurricane Ridge's favorite part. Yeah. That, the I have a picture of Hurricane Ridge. I'll show. Uh, well, actually, since FS Streamer brought it up, I'll, I'll bring it up here and we'll see it in the game in just a second. But the uh, Hurricane Ridge is... It's just this gorgeous little spot. And you can see the the visitor center off to the right here, but it's supposed to be incredible views. Um, this is just one photo of, of many, but there was uh, it was really, really pretty to see. So that's also one that's easy to drive to if you're more inclined to go driving. One thing that I would be curious about if people have seen or noticed anything is any observations of your own different ecosystems. So Crazy Tycho already nailed that one with, you know, Minnesota winter sort of having that on again, off again snow, and that that sort of has a lot of impact on what sort of animals you see or plants that can develop. I had a uh, friend who was really into Minnesota wine because the wine and grapes that grow in a climate like that are very different than the kinds of wine and grapes you would get out of like a Washington or like a France sort of location. And so they swore that the Minnesota grapes were uh, better in some cases, but definitely different. Uh, so if you're looking for a, a wine suggestion, that's something to check out. But it's also kind of an interesting expression of an ecosystem. Uh, any other ones that, that you've noticed or like, you know, places you've been that kind of had interesting sort of climates? I'd be curious to hear in the chat. The 
other piece I'll kind of mention. So Crazy Tycho mentioned, you know, the winters. The one that I am most surprised by, maybe I should stop being surprised at this point, but in researching these parks is how important fires are and the impact of fires on the ecosystem, how the plants are designed to survive. Uh, Joshua Tree we went to uh, two weeks back now, you know, fires are a big part of that park and the Joshua trees themselves, those uh, yucca plants, are they they evolved to be resistant to a certain amount of fire because they're tall enough and designed in such a way that the fire won't go and burn them down if it does start. And lots of parks have that sort of sort of artifacts to them. Just a nature of uh, adaptations to survive, right? Ah, fractals, naturally occurring ice wine would be cool. Bird migration, yeah. Fractals on the bird side. Bird migration is fun to watch, uh, especially. Yeah, we haven't we haven't done bird migrations as a topic yet, but that's uh, that comes up for quite a few different parks. Odd reasoning, you should check out ice wine when you can. Uh, it's it's very um, sweet. It's I think it may be higher alcohol content, but it's definitely very very sweet. Uh, usually it comes in smaller bottles and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I got my head out the window here looking at the mountains. So what is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is a community of living organisms in conjunction with the non-living components in their environment interacting as a system. So you have your non-living components, your living components, all together in one environment, and then how they interact with each other. So for instance, there's a marine reef is one kind of ecosystem we've talked about. Or you may have a temperate rainforest, which is, you know, this is another picture from uh, Olympic Peninsula. So this is likely the, the same rainforest we just flew over. Those are different kinds of ecosystems. These living and non-living components are linked together through nutrient cycles and energy flows. We'll talk about both of those things. So energy enters the system through photosynthesis and is incorporated into plant tissue. By feeding on plants and on one another, animals play an important role in moving of matter and energy throughout the system. They also influence the quantity of plant and microbio uh, microbial biomass present. By breaking down dead organic matter, decomposers release carbon back into the atmosphere and facilitate nutrient cycling by converting nutrients stored in dead biomass back to a form that can be readily used by plants and other microbes. That was a whole mouthful of things. That's a three sentence summary of what we're going to talk about for the whole rest of the topic. So if you missed it, don't worry, we'll, we'll come back to it. So what creates an ecosystem? Ecosystems are controlled both by external and internal factors. External factors control the overall structure of the ecosystem and the way things work within it, but are not themselves influenced by the ecosystem. So an example of an, uh, oops, I should catch up on the chat and then I'll talk about external factors. Uh, hey, thanks FSTormer. Oh, too bad. Yeah, I've only had, I don't know why everyone seems to have it crash from time to time. I've only had the game crash, probably crash for reasons that weren't my own fault, which sometimes I'll do dumb things with the community folder. But uh, but I've only had it crash just kind of randomly a couple times, the most memorable of which was after an eight and a half hour flight I did. I was trying to do the flight from a Sobo headquarters to Microsoft headquarters, whatever that achievement is. Um, and it crashed right as I was landing. So anyway classic story uh, sorry that's a very random sidebar but okay so uh, yes odd reason you should try ice wine in summary external factors internal factors so external factors are things that are influence the structure and the way that the ecosystem works but are not themselves um, part of the ecosystem are not influenced by the ecosystem so this is things like rainfall patterns uh, mostly climate related things Seasonal temperatures uh, will influence photosynthesis and other things like the amount of water available, and that sets a lot of what the, the ecosystem is going to look like. I'm going to pop out of the plane here so we can see this is coming up on Hurricane Ridge. So there's some hiking trails here, which is probably where uh, FS Streamer was, uh, was walking around. And then we'll round again, but you can see the, the view here is really pretty. Okay. 
So that's external factors. Again, things that are not themselves influenced by the ecosystem, but do affect the ecosystem. Unlike external factors, internal factors in ecosystems not only control ecosystem processes, but are also controlled by them. So consequently, they're more subject to things like feedback loops. While the resource inputs are generally controlled by external processes like climate, the availability of these resources within an ecosystem is controlled by internal factors like decomposition, root competition, or shading. Other elements, like the types of species present, are also internal factors. So we talk about something like an ecosystem. It's useful to talk about it in terms of the couple of key processes that are going on. When they teach you about a plane, when you're first learning to fly, they'll often teach you about the different systems in that plane because it helps you understand each individual system and how it works, and then it's easier to see how to put it all back together. So we're going to do that same thing with ecosystems. We're going to talk a bit about a couple of different areas of an ecosystem. I'm going to start by doing an overview of all five of them. Really four, but five-ish. Um, an overview of all five of them, so like a one-sentence summary of each of the five points. And then I'll go into more detail on each one afterwards. So if it's uh, if it gets overwhelming, don't worry, we're going to come back to it and we'll, we'll spend a little bit more time on each one. So the first piece of an ecosystem to know is the energy flow process. So the flow of energy through living things within an ecosystem is called the energy flow. This includes things like the food chain. Under this also includes how energy gets between the ecosystem, uh, gets into an ecosystem, excuse me, usually through photosynthesis, and then how it moves between organisms. This flow is unidirectional, meaning ener energy enters the system and it leaves the system. The second system we're going to talk about, second process, is nutrient cycling. So this is mineral nutrients in an ecosystem that are mostly cycled back and forth between plants, animals, microbes, and soil. This means, unlike the energy flow, it's cyclic. So whereas energy flow is in and out, nutrient cycling actually goes in a circle around the ecosystem. A related element to both of those two, then, is decomposition. So this is the process by which dead organic substances are broken down into simpler organic or inorganic matter. This is critical to both the energy flow and uh, as decomposers can be eaten, and also to the nutrient cycle, because they help to return nutrients back into the ecosystem. The other two areas we'll talk a little about, so those are kind of the cycles part of it. The other two areas we'll talk about, first one is function and biodiversity. So ecosystem processes are driven by the particular species in an ecosystem, the nature of those individual species, and the relative abundance of, e of organisms within those species. So it's a lot, but it's sort of like the composition of organisms in the ecosystem has a lot of impact on the ecosystem itself. So, Real quick, I'll point out, that's the visitor center on Hurricane Ridge, so you can see why people like to, to drive up here and get this honestly incredible view of the park. Um, so I'll do a quick spin around so you can see everything. This is why people like to visit this particular one, though. OK. So as function of biodiversity, the last one that we'll talk about is resistance and resilience. So ecosystems themselves are dynamic entities. They are subject to periodic disturbances, things like forest fires, and are in the process of recovering from some past disturbance at any given time. The tendency of an ecosystem to remain close to its equilibrium state, despite that disturbance, is called resistance. On the other hand, the speed at which it returns to its initial state is called resilience. So resistance is how much it resists changing from its initial state. Resilience is how quickly it comes back to its initial state. All right, I know that was a lot, so let's go into a little bit more detail on each of those real quick. So we'll start with energy flow. Uh, actually, what we're going to start with is me descending to 3,000 feet. So let me quick do that before I forget. So I'm going to do the same sort of thing that I did before. I'll set my altitude to where I want to be. So I'm 3,100 is fine, whatever, OK. And then vertical speed, I'm going to put this to, uh, I'm going to do 1,000 feet per minute so that we can get down kind of in the valley a little bit quicker. I'm catching up in the chat here. Yeah, fract <laughs> more fractals is like I didn't sign up for a biology course. Yeah, there you go. It's just ecosystems. Ah, oh, flying singer, cool. Should post some some screenshots in the Discord afterwards. <laughs> I 
Yeah, Mad Wisman Girl. Avoid avoid the ridges, yeah. It's good mountain flying practice. All right, so this is Hurricane Ridge. I pulled up that photo of. Uh, this is another river that kind of cuts to the park, so this is a common way you can go and see it. All right, back to ecosystems. So we had four different topics we'll cover. First one we're going to talk about is the energy flow. This is also called the carbon cycle. So you hear it called both those things. So energy gets into an ecosystem almost always via photosynthesis. In this case, water plus carbon dioxide becomes oxygen and glucose. The sugar then, so they are able to take carbon dioxide plants and turn it into a kind of sugar. The sugar then becomes energy for the plants or for other animals as they ingest it. This flow of energy is actually captured really well in the... Let me slow this plane down just a little bit here. It's captured really well in a GIF that is actually specific to this park, which is kind of cool. Uh, so this is an overview of the energy flow in Olympic National Park. So again, carbon cycle, same sort of name. So you'll see the water moving around. You'll see the photosynthesis occurring. So water plus uh, carbon dioxide, or carbon in this case. Um, and then that becomes... Um, I'm sorry, this is oxygen. Anyway, the, the energy piece of this is all the green stuff. So sort of, a, sort of a cool way to see how energy moves in and out. And you can see photosynthesis coming in, and then eventually it just leaves. So that's that unidirectional sort of aspect of it. So we know how energy now gets in initially from the sun. From there, it's just a food chain with each layer gaining the energy of the layers that it eats. So if we look at something like this... You can think of it as the sun's energy comes in as the primary producers. This would be those plants we were just looking at. And then as you go up, you get to your primary consumers, secondary consumers, all the way up to apex predators. Primary uh, producers here photosynthesize, while the other la layers cannot. Well, uh, okay, so of the net energy at each level, only 10% moves up to the next layer. So... Something that is a herbivore gets 10% of the energy available in the plants. If it's a carnivore and eats primary consumers, then it only gets 1% of the energy that originally came in, and on and on up. That's often why it's called, or sometimes called, the food pyramid. That's a bit of a confusing name for the other food pyramid, but that is why it's, it's a pyramid shape because of that. Or the energy pyramid, in this case, is what they called it. Uh, to see some real energy pyramids, you can get a sense of this. So here's one from an aquatic ecosystem. So you have phytoplankton, get eaten by zooplankton, up to sea lions. And then a terrestrial ecosystem, grasses, all the way up to snakes, for instance. We can look at a bit more complex one. So in this case, we have decomposers on the bottom. And these are, are actually uh, taking in dead organic matter and then and contributing it back to the, the ecosystem. That same sort of... I'm um, doing a quick time check here. Okay. Let me do this. Let me pull up briefly. So this is Lake Crescent that we're coming up on, which is a beautiful lake. And this is the reason I wanted to be kind of summertime for this piece of the flight. So this is a picture of Lake Crescent uh, in the real world. This is one of those gems that I don't know if I would have gone to based on just reading the park materials, but flying over it in flight sim, I, I kind of said, this seems like a place to go visit. So a cool one to check out. Okay, so that's the energy cycle. We talked about the, the energy pyramid and, and some of the ways that energy moves around. The next one we'll talk about is the nutrient cycle. This is the movement or exchange of inorganic or organic matter back into the production of matter. So where energy flow is unidirectional and not uh, non-cyclic, mineral nutrients is cyclic. So for instance, if we look at this diagram, it's a little bit more like from a science textbook, but that's okay. You can see the sun in yellow here, and then you can see energy leaving at each of these different stages, but decomposers uh, cycle that mineral nutrient back in and then it comes back to the producers at the bottom here. One particularly important nutrient is nitrogen, since there is a scarcity of usable nitrient, nitrogen in many types of ecosystems. This makes nitrogen a limiting factor in ecosystem uh, production, like we talked about in the poll. Because of this, nitrogen availability can affect the rate of key ecosystem processes, including primary production and decomposition. Quick overview of the nitrogen cycle looks like this. It was a little bit overwhelming and we won't spend much time on it, but just kind of cool to see that there's a lot of elements going on here. Hey there, Trey. Uh, fractals, why don't we do this? Do you mind posting up the next or the the next park poll? And we'll let folks vote on that. So we'll, we'll do a vote on where we want to go next. And then I promise I will finish up the next five minutes or so. 
and then I'll hop into Discord afterwards if people still want to hang out and fly more. Uh, you can see the, the airport at the end of the park is pretty cool. Thank you, Fractal. So Bryce Canyon National Park, uh, Shenandoah National Park, or Lake Clark National Park. I'll give folks a minute to vote on that one. All right, so we talked about the uh, carbon cycle, we talked about the nutrient cycle. The next element we talked about is function and biodiversity. So ecosystem processes are broad generalizations. Ooh. Let me make sure that I'm not about to run into this wall. Oh, I totally am. Huh. Oops. So I tried to cut the corner there. It's your awareness of an airplane. All right. Let's get myself back up on track. So anyone who was doing autopilot, uh, heads up that the pass the pyramid mountain uh, is not a friendly, <laughs> not a friendly pass. I don't know why it it was so close to cut corner, but that's okay. Uh, okay. So the important piece about function and biodiversity to an ecosystem is that this is how certain species within an ecosystem start to specialize. So if you have an ecosystem where uh, a species is filling a particular role, if you have another organism that comes in and tries to fill that same role, They'll compete until one of them wins, and then the species that didn't win either needs to evolve or it uh, will disappear, it goes extinct. It's also the reason we start to get things like keystone species, like the alligator was in the Everglades. So let's talk about keystone species real quick. I mentioned that they, uh, an ecosystem will have certain species, uh, every species has, an, or every organism has an impact on the ecosystem. If it's a very distinct or dominant species, it'll have a, a broader impact than others, while rarer species tend to have kind of a small impact on the ecosystem. A keystone species, then, is a species that tends to have an effect on the ecosystem that is disproportionate to their abundance in the ecosystem. So it's not so much that they have a big impact because a very dominant species may have a big impact, it's that they have a big impact for how few there are of them. That's what makes things like alligators a, a big... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, keystone species. The other role that's interesting in an ecosystem is called an ecosystem engineer. And so this is any organism that creates, significantly modifies, maintains, or destroys a habitat. Uh, beavers are a classic example here, but alligators from Everglades are also a good example of a ecosystem engineer because they create those alligator holes that hold water through the seasons. Just to spend two seconds here on the last topic, which was the dynamics of an ecosystem, so resilience and resistance. Uh, resistance, remember, was how much it resists changes from things like wildfires or uh, from, from a disturbance, any kind of disturbance. And then the second, resilience, is how quickly it returns to its initial state. So if you have like a, a major disturbance, like a volcanic eruption, this is sort of what the uh, secession looks like. So after there's some disturbance, it goes through primary secession, starts as basically rocks, no soil, and then has to build back up. A less severe disturbance may still leave the soil intact, in which case it goes through secondary secession. It doesn't have to do with the same process as it would if it was like a volcanic eruption. All right, and I saw that our poll winner here was Shenandoah National Park. Awesome. I'm excited to go visit that with you. So in summary, an ecosystem is a community of living organisms in conjunction with the non-living components of their environment, interacting as a system. There are several key processes at play, including energy flow, which is unidirectional, nutrient flow, which is cyclic, diversity and function of individual organisms, and impact of di uh, disturbances and how the ecosystem responds. Ecosystems exist in every park or area we visit, uh, though uh, in every area we visit, here or in real life, which is part of why I'm so excited to talk about them in general. They come up every single time we go fly somewhere. I hope it gives you a way to think about the nature that you see outside your own home as well. Sort of bring it back. So an interesting element here, just to close out with a quick joke, is something called a nurse log, which is really common to see in the Pacific Northwest. So a nurse log is just a dead tree uh, that's very nutrient rich, and so decomposers and other organisms will use it as a source of nutrients and a good place to grow. It's a nurse log. And so that helps to answer one of two age-old questions. Uh, specifically, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? So I can't answer the sound part, but at least now you know that it does provide a lot of nutrient-rich uh, energy for organisms and makes a lot of organisms in the ecosystem very happy. 
Of course, the second age-old question is, if a man speaks in the woods and his spouse isn't around to hear him, is he still wrong? The answer here, of course, is yes, he is still wrong. Uh, it's not related to ecosystems, but it's good to keep in mind. All right, <laughs> thanks, Fractals, for posting up those, uh, those polls. So today we talked about uh, Olympic National Park. We went and, or we talked about uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, we talked about elk, and then we talked about ecosystems. Fractals post up the serve in the chat. Come hang out in Discord if you'd like. Uh, follow me on Twitter if you just want uh, notifications about the flights we're going to do. And I'm very excited to explore Shenandoah National Park with you next week. It's one of my grandpa's favorite uh, national parks. So with that, thank you all for being my co-pilot today. And until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. And I will see you all next week, unless you're in Discord, in which case I will come hang out in Discord in about 30 seconds. So 